Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, The Present Glory, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Leviticus, chapter 9. This has been one of the toughest years I've ever put in. And uh, this summer has been one of the most difficult for me. Uh, I've mentioned before that uh, there's been a problem of great concern to my heart, a heavy burden laid upon me that has uh, uh, drawn and taxed me to a great degree. And uh, several times through the summer it reached a kind of climax in which I felt very pressured, very much under the load of this concern. And uh, every time that I got into a place like that, I found that I reached a place where my own personal prayer seemed to be unavailing. I wasn't getting relief from it. And each time God sent along someone at the precise moment, just the right person, to say a word that helped me. Sometimes they weren't aware of it. Sometimes they were. But in every case, it was just the right time. On one occasion, I just had reached a place where I felt like I was beating my head against a brick wall. And uh, emotionally and physically, too, about to uh, break with the strain when uh, uh, a man came out of, from out of town into this area. And uh, as he told me afterwards, he didn't really have any reason to come through here, but he just did. And uh, I had just been thinking about him and wishing that I could talk with him when I learned he was here. We got together for lunch, and he said a few words to me that just just delivered me and helped me. And uh, these experiences like this, we've all had them, are ways God underscores to us the need of a priest. See, that's the process of priesthood. That's the ministry of a fellow priest in the body of Christ. This is the great truth that the church has lost sight of in our generation. Martin Luther discovered it back again back in the days of the Reformation, when he brought to light again what he called the priesthood of every believer, the ability to be used in the life of someone else to help them in a time of emotional or intellectual struggle by the power of God. Now, that's what we're looking at in this 8th and ninth chapters of Leviticus as we're uh, studying through the provision God makes for the basic needs of our humanity. We've seen how in the offerings he meets the need to be loved and the need to love in return, the need for peace, the need to have our guilt removed, the need to have our restoration, uh, restoration of relationships to others and our broken fellowship restored, and now the need for a priest. And God has made ample provision, first in the great high priest who's given to us, our Lord Jesus. Now here's the underlying resource of every Christian. And I think if there's any truth that needs to be captured again and lived again in daily experience, it's the availability of the Lord Jesus as the great high priest, as symbolized by Aaron in the Old Testament. And then with him were Aaron's sons, remember, who are a picture of the priesthood of the believer and uh, the ministry that each of us can have with one another in meeting the emotional and intellectual problems of life. Now, last week, last time we studied together, we were looking in the eighth chapter at the process to priesthood, tracing the way by which God uh, produces priests and it began, you remember, by the washing and the clothing and the anointing of Aaron as the great high priest, beautifully picturing what Jesus Christ was set apart of the Holy Spirit to do, both in the days of his flesh and now through his risen life and through the Holy Spirit in our lives today. And then we remember, we went on to see how the, the sons of Aaron, uh, gathered with him and shared this priesthood with him. And they too went through a process of clothing, being clothed, and offerings were made for them. And they were anointed. 
not with just oil as, as, they, as Aaron was, because he was a picture of Christ. and The oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. But this time, the sons were anointed with oil and blood. Blood necessary because of the evil, the sin of, in their own lives. And finally, in the end of chapter 8, we found them feasting together in the tabernacle on the thigh of the offering uh, and uh, the bread of the cereal offering, uh, symbols of strength and life imparted to them by the uh, sacrifice on their behalf, pictures to us of our life in Christ. And remember, Moses then charged Aaron and his sons to stay in the tabernacle and for seven days not to go out of the tabernacle. They were to stay there and eat the meat and the bread provided for them, and they must not leave the tabernacle for seven days. Now the ninth chapter picks up this process and introduces us to the final steps in this process of becoming priests. And it opens with a very instructive word. The first verse of the ninth chapter says, On the eighth day, the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. I hope you're getting familiar with the meaning and significance of numbers and uh, of these various symbols employed in the Old Testament. They are God's great visual aids to help us to understand truth that's very important to us. And the eighth day is a significant number. The eight is the number of a new beginning, a resurrection, in other words. And so the eighth day is a symbol of resurrection life. Now, this is not mere guesswork. Not only is this number used this way consistently throughout the Old Testament and the New, but it's also stamped right into nature itself. For instance, there's the week. Now, this is the eighth day. It's the beginning of a new week, Sunday. We've just lived through seven days together this week. That is, together in this area of the world, anyway. And uh, now we're beginning a new day, a new week. One of the strange mysteries of human life is the week. It's easy to explain why we have months, because they represent the phases of the year, of the moon. The uh, year, of course, is the time it takes for the sun to travel around the sun, uh, the earth to travel around the sun. But no one can explain why we have a week, and yet weeks are part of the human family and known to the human uh, family since its very beginning. Seven days, nothing happens in nature that corresponds with it, but everybody has observed a week from the earliest times. And... Uh, uh, this eighth day is a very significant day because it marks the beginning of a new. Now you have this in music as well. All of you know that the scale represents seven notes with an eighth note that is the first of the new beginning. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And do starts all over again. So that eight is a beginning note, the new day, the new beginning. And by this means, you see, God is teaching us that the process of priesthood, the ministry of being a priest, must be on the basis of a resurrection power. We must trust in the work of a living God within us, new life, a new beginning, not on the basis of the old life with its attempt to try to garner wisdom from here and there and put it all together and work our way through life. We've all, you know, subject to good advice by well-meaning people. And that good advice has often led us into the very most difficult times of our lives. And God is wiping, in a sense, wiping that all out. And he says, I don't want you to rest on that. I want you to operate as priests from resurrection life, from the scriptures, understood in the power of the Holy Spirit and relating to the sensitive need of an individual so that the word you give as a priest to someone else will not be your wisdom, 
but God. Now, that's what this all means. And that's why Moses insisted these people do not leave the tabernacle for seven days. God had said, if you leave before seven days are up, you'll die. Because God <laughs> takes his own word seriously. And he's by that means saying, look, don't try to operate as a priest on any other basis than resurrection power. It'll never work. You'll only produce death if you try to do it on any other basis. And that very instructive word is such a help, I hope, to us. This is the problem, you see, with much of the church today. I've just returned from traveling about in the Middle West, and uh, once again I come back somewhat discouraged. Here on the West Coast we're seeing a lot of new life coming into the churches, but in the rest of the nation it's just barely beginning in a few spots. For the most part the church the evangelical churches uh, are carrying on in a very sterile, uh, dry, dull performance that uh, is uh, that is turn, turning off most of the youth of their area, carrying on with an empty shell of performance that it, and with services that are appallingly dull. And young people are frankly saying so all over the country. Well, what's the reason? Well, it's largely because we've substituted the intended power by which Christians are to live by the processes the world lives on around us. We've substituted slick organization and electric, electronic techniques and high-gear promotion and pressure tactics as the means by which the church affects the world. But God's people have never moved on that basis in, in the scriptures and in history. God is continually struggling through this word to teach us that he doesn't depend upon majority vote to win his battles. He always is selecting just a handful of people. I was uh, reading an article the other day in which a Christian writer uh, said with considerable uh, rejoicing, evidently, that uh, it looked like in the next few years, Brazil would become the first Protestant nation of Latin America. That the church is growing so fast in Brazil that soon you can expect to have 51% of the population become Protestant. And that, according to this article, was a hopeful day when at last, by the power of numbers, the church could begin to sway the, uh, the, the, the nation of Brazil and affect it. But God never waits for that. God always moves to a handful. And it isn't, it isn't necessary for us to have a majority of the population ever. God's always teaching us that by sending people home and turning them away and driving them all back. Jesus spoke to his disciples and said things that were hard. And many began to leave him, it said. And even the disciples, the twelve, said to him, uh, uh, acted as though they were going, so that he said to them, will you also go away? With the implication, well, if you want to, go. <laughs> All I need is the power of a living God. Well, this is what we need. And uh, we need to learn that when we rely on natural power, we thereby forego supernatural power. The natural strength is not enough, never will be, to do the job. Now the reason why we do it this way, I think, is revealed in the next section here. For beginning with verse 2 and running clear on down through verse 21, you have another section that details for us the offerings that were offered in connection with the, priest, with the ordaining of the priests here. There were, first of all, sin offerings and burnt offerings offered for Aaron himself. Verse 2, Moses said to Aaron, Take a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And in verse 8 we're told, So Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And also the burnt offering in verse 12 was for himself. And then there was a sin offering and a burnt offering for the people. Verse uh, 3, say to the people of Israel, take a male goat 
for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish, for a burnt offering. And then there were peace offerings to be offered for the people. Verse 4, uh, with, uh, and uh, an ox and a ram for peace offerings to uh, sacrifice before the Lord, and a cereal offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. And then these offerings were given, as recounted in the rest of this chapter. Now, once again, we run into this strange prominence of offerings and of blood throughout this whole section. Why does God constantly put this blood in every time? Why was nothing done apart from a sacrifice, a death? We well, see, God is saying something to us. He's shouting at us that he wants to get across to us a fundamental truth. That, as in this case, the power of a priesthood, the resurrection power of a living God at work within his people, can never be exercised apart from a previous death. When these Israelites brought these offerings, as in this case, these innocent animals whose blood had to be shed, whose lives had to be forfeited, they were expected to learn something from these sacrifices. See, these were not mere rituals that they went through to kind of placate an angry god and then they could go on and live unchanged, sort of an umbrella of protection against the wrath of, a, uh, of an angry deity. But these offerings were expected to teach the offerers something. They were not to offer them and go on unchanged. Something had to die within them, was the idea. They were not just merely offered on behalf of the individual. They were the individual. And that's what the individual had to learn from this. This was a substitute accepted only because they had to identify with this offering. And something had to happen in them. That's what God is getting across. And of course it symbolizes, you see, the end of all the natural resources of life. And this is the key to the use of resurrection power. This last week, in fact, yesterday, uh, Friday, I'm sorry, I drove over to Monterey to have a part with a, a uh, layman's leadership conference that was going on over there, and uh, leaders from all over the country were invited to participate in that, and among the speakers that were there was an old friend of mine, and many of you know him too, Dr. Don Mumaw, who's pastor of the Bel Air Presbyterian Church in Southern California. Don, as many of you remember, was an All-American linebacker with UCLA during his football career in college. And uh, a speaker didn't show up Friday. And in his place, the leader asked Don Muma to just share out of his own life and experience what God had taught him. And so he did. And I've never heard Don say what he said yesterday, uh, Friday. It was very moving. But he told about how, as a boy growing up, he fell in love with football. He hung around the football lot and uh, got involved with uh, football, began to love the sport, played it through his high school career. And uh, since he had a big body, sharp mind, and a dedicated spirit, he, he became a good football player. And when he went on to college at UCLA, in his sophomore year, he, he became an All-American. And uh, Don Muma told us what happened to him when he became an All-American. He said, without uh, realizing quite what was happening, he found that every American, every other American, has an image of what an All-American is like. And Don said he began to find himself trying to fill that image. He's an All-American, is a champion at everything he does. And Don Muma said he tried to live up to that. Now, in his junior year, he became a Christian. 
And it wasn't very long before he felt himself drawn of God to the ministry, and he began to prepare and think about being a minister. And involved with other Christians, he entered into all the activities around. But he found that he was still trying to live up to the image of an All-American. And an All-American is always ahead of everybody else. So if he, if they, in the meeting, started talking about how many verses they memorized, he made a list of the one who memorized the most, and then he memorized 15 more than that. And when he talked about how many hours they spent in prayer, he noted the one that had spent the most time, and he spent two hours more than he did. Because an all-American, you see, never comes short. He's always out ahead of everybody else. And he kept doing this innocently, without realizing it, finding that he was putting on a facade, and living up to an image that was not real. And all through his uh, ministry, he was up here at the uh, First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley, he said he found himself always trying to fulfill the expectation of someone else. Now, you see, that's a familiar pattern, isn't it? We all live like that. We all find, whatever it is, we're not all Americans, but we're all, uh, uh, we all have some image expected of us, some role that we fulfill. And we try to do it, quite innocently. We're not always trying to gain something for ourselves, but because it's expected of us. And it's that which is the characteristic of the natural life. And that is what God is telling us has to die, has to end. Damuma went on to tell us in a very moving way how God taught him that truth. How little by little and through humiliation and experience of weakness and failure, God finally taught him to stop living up to a facade and to give up trying to be an all-American in everybody's eyes and just be himself and to be content with God at work through him. And he told us what a relief it brought to his heart to finally find that, uh, that he could just be what he was, his humanity, that's all, just in the way God had put it together for him, filled with God's spirit and saying what he he himself felt like, and not worrying about what someone else thought about it. And you see, that's what God's after. That's what he's talking about here. This is what this means. This is not just so much uh, theological gas. This is what God's getting across to us, that the natural life has to end. Isn't that what Jesus is saying? He Remember how he put it? Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth life. And death precedes life. All life that's worth living, God is saying, comes out of death. It's never the other way around. We don't like that dying. We don't like that losing, that, that uh, desire to fulfill an image. We want to fulfill our role. We don't like the idea that somebody finds out that we're not all they expect us to be. And so we resist this dying. But our Lord is telling us that's the only way we'll ever find life. Jesus said, you remember? If, you, a, if a man hold on to his life, he try to save his life, he'll lose it. You try to hang on to it and get all you can out of it and uh, uh, try to, uh, you know, follow the world's rule. Uh, watch out for yourself. No one else is going to. Get it all for yourself. Be on the spot. First thing, to get all you can because nobody else is going to take care of you. You hang on that way and you'll find life filters through your fingers. You can't hang on to it gone. You're left with an empty shell of all you try to preserve. How many are discovering that? But as Jesus said, if you throw it away, if you lose it for my sake, you'll save it. Just give it up and you'll save it. Now that's exactly what's being taught here back in the Old Testament. That's not New Testament truth alone at all. 
That's what God is saying. Out of life, out of death comes life. And when we're ready to surrender on the basis of a death, this dependence on our natural resources and strength, then we can lay hold of the supernatural strength of a living Lord and resurrection power. And not only for us, but for others as well. Have a ministry to them. Look at the result now, verse uh, 22. All these offerings come in here, and then at the end we read, Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came forth from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat upon the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. What a dramatic scene. Here are the thousands and thousands of Israelites gathered around to observe what's happening in this open space before the door of the tabernacle, where the brazen altar is. And they watch Aaron and his sons kill these animals and put them on the offering and sprinkle the blood and pour it out. And when everything is done exactly as the Lord commands, Moses and Aaron go in together into the tabernacle and there's a hush falls on the whole assembly. No one knows what's going to happen. But when Aaron and Moses come out, they bless the people and suddenly the glory of the Lord appeared. Now what was that? Well, as best we can determine from other scriptures, it was a shining cloud of light, the Shekinah, it's called, a shining glory of light that suddenly appeared, filled that whole area. Later, it took up residence in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, where it was suspended over the altar, the Ark of the Covenant. But uh, here it appears before all the people this glory of light, and a fire, a supernatural fire proceeds from it that consumes in a flash all the rest of the offerings upon the altar. Most impressive scene. No wonder the people fell on their faces and shouted. This is a shout of victory, a shout of the sense of awe and wonder that the God of glory is in their midst. Now put this all together. This is God's instructive way of teaching us. What is the lesson? Well, you see, there's a counterpart in our lives. We're to be priests like these. And the end of priesthood is to produce the glory of the Lord. That's what comes when it's operated properly. When it all is done as God commands, then it works out to produce the glory of the Lord and the fire of God. And that glory in our lives now is the character, the beauty of the character of Jesus. The New Testament says that the Spirit of God is at work in our hearts, the passage was read to you this morning, to produce glory unto glory. And uh, the glory of God is found in the face of Jesus Christ. That's where you find it. So that God's character, the character of Jesus, appearing in you and in me, in our daily encounters with people, is the counterpart of the glory of the Lord here. This past week back in Illinois, I spoke at a breakfast group on a, sun on a Saturday morning, and I noticed a woman out in the audience that had a patch on her eye. Her right eye was covered, and much of her nose. And uh, yet the part of her face that I could see was radiant. And uh, I wondered who she was. And at the end of the meeting, she came up to me and just took my hand and thanked me. Said, oh, what a wonderful service. How much she enjoyed it. How delightful it was. How it administered to her. And uh, she could, I noticed she had some difficulty talking, but her face was just radiant. Later on, I met her husband and told me her story, how she had 
discovered three or four years ago that she had cancer of the eye. And she went to a doctor and they removed the eye. And later the cancer returned and she had to go back and they took away part of the bone around the eye. And again she had to go back. And this time they removed part of her nose and her cheekbone. And all of this had to go. And uh, once again, she had to return for further operations so that most of her face was, half of her face was gone already. And her husband told me that of the joy that this woman lived in continually, just an unbroken sense of joy that just flooded her being and that she just had to express all the time. Though she had had plenty of struggles, and times of, 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 uh, resentment and bitterness. God had led her into joy. And he said, you know, she wasn't like that before. She was a complaining woman. She complained about everything. And God used this to bring her to a sense of joy and turned all that complaint and all that sorrow into joy. And she was in our body life service last Sunday night. And she spoke and shared something of the joyful spirit that she had. And I just felt led to ask her to pray for everybody in that congregation that was struggling with their circumstances. Struggling and complaining and rejecting and resisting where God had put them. That they might learn that wonderful ministry of priesthood to take and, and change it into joy. Remember Jesus said to his disciples, in the moment of their agony, when they were facing with him the cross and the loneliness that his, that his departure would mean, he said to them, your sorrows will be turned into joy. And it was predicted of him in the book of Isaiah that he would come and bring uh, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for the spirit of mourning, and he would replace these things with inner joy. And this is what it's talking about. This is the purpose of his priesthood. And it's the purpose of your priesthood in the lives of others. That you might enter in somehow into the circumstances and into a sensitivity with the individual involved. So that the words that you speak are able to release them from the outward despair around into inner joy and inner glory. That's what God is saying to us, isn't it? There's no glory without this process of priesthood. But the end of priesthood is that the glory of the Lord might be manifest. Father, thank you for this time of teaching together how deeply you've instructed us from this word. We pray that we may understand it and take it literally and seriously, and realize that this indeed is the joy of our ministry, and the joy of your ministry in our lives as well. Help us to stop resisting what you're doing with us. Help us to stop our complaining and our griping and our murmuring against your processes, and accept this death, this uh, dying to the uh, feeding of our self-image, this uh, necessity to appear to be something that we're not, this fulfilling of a role, this uh, upholding of a facade, because out of that death, Lord, will come your life. We pray that that may characterize us, that the glory of the Lord may be seen in us. We ask in your name. Amen. Your name is the highest, your name is the 